and good morning. Welcome everybody. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy Friday mornings. Um, I know it's been a frantic week because we're all catching up after conference season, I think. So really great that we could have an hour of your time today. I can see some people joining as I speak. So I'm going to tread water for just a few more seconds just to give people um, a chance to join. But I'd like to say a very, very warm welcome to you all and a warm welcome to our panelists who I will introduce in due course. My name's Jeremy Yap and I'm the head of flexible energy systems at BEMA. BEMA is the trade association for uh, providers and suppliers and manufacturers of electrotechnical equipment, which is everything from plugs and sockets all the way up to big network switchgear and cables and so on, and most things in between. In 2015, we published a guide to electric vehicle infrastructure, which apparently was quite useful and um, it had a lot of downloads. I think a lot of people um, found it something like a, quite, a, quite a useful one-stop one -stop shop for information about what was then relatively new electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Quite a lot of that information is now available quite easily just on Wikipedia and so on. But we thought it was still useful um, as an exercise to update that and keep it all in one place. And while we were talking about doing this, uh, we had the good fortune to be approached by the Green Finance Institute, who were thinking of doing something uh, sim similar. I'll let them talk about it um, in a moment, but geared more for investors. So we were just really, really fortunate to have uh, the stars align, if you like, at just the right time for us to work with the Green Finance Institute to write a second edition of our 2015 guide alongside some guidance for investors in this um, still relatively nascent but and very important and fast growing market for electric vehicle infrastructure. So the reason we wrote this guide is partly to correct some misinformation that is out there, but mostly just to have a really convenient, easy to find, easy to use guide to the technology and how that technology fits together from an electrical point of view and from a communications technology point of view. Both of those things are changing quickly. So once again, what we've tried to do with this guide is future-proof it as much as possible and not describe in terrific detail exactly what communications protocols you might be using or exactly what the engineering recommendation G100 requirements are for your home, for example. Um, so, but we've, what we hope we have done is we hope we have given users, investors, even manufacturers and installers and other part, pieces of that puzzle. We hope we have given you all at least enough information to make a better informed start on your journey within electric vehicle infrastructure. Um, obviously, there are lots of other more detailed guides and documents out there that specific pieces of the supply chain or of the, in, of the infrastructure community will use. There's, there are code of, codes of practice for installation, for example. Um, there are lots of standards and specifications that people need to understand. And we've listed as many as we could find that would be of most use in section eight of the guide. So what I'd really like to call people's attention to now, if I may, is chapter three of the guide, which describes the technology and discusses a little bit about integration, but also just takes some time to explain perhaps what a CCS plug is, or what a CHAdeMO plug is, or what a smart cable is, or the difference between um, a public and a private charger. Some of these things feel obvious to us. Um, they are not obvious to everybody. So I think it's really important um, to have a, a fairly 
basic level of, of knowledge and understanding, and then to grow that with what is hopefully more detail and enough useful detail. So even experts in this field are going to find some aspects of that guide useful. And then in section eight, we have listed, um, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and say a really um, unrivaled and comprehensive list of the standards and specifications and protocols and requirements and so forth that a manufacturer of EV supply equipment will need to deal with and that other people in this supply chain where it's, well, maybe not component providers, but certainly installers and users and investors will hopefully find section eight very useful, even if it's just a bit of a checklist to show your, um, maybe you could show your sales team and say, when you go into a conversation with this technology provider, ask them about these things. So we really hope that by putting a little bit more confidence and certainty into people's minds when they consider the technology, we take away some of that fear of the technology and we want to make it easier to invest. We want to make it easier to sell infrastructure. We want to make it easier to buy infrastructure. So we hope we're not making a rod for our own backs, if you like, by saying, here's a list of all the things you should ask the manufacturers when you buy from us. What we'd really like is just to demystify some of these things uh, and clear the way to a rapid but sustainable investment in a rollout of infrastructure, which I think we all agree is absolutely essential if we're going to meet our net zero requirements, if we're going to have cleaner air, if we're going to have simply just a, a better, more electrified world. So I commend sections three and eight to you. Those were the parts of the document that are most like the 2015 BEMA guide. So those are the parts of the document, if you like, that I and my members had most to do with. And um, just to say a big thanks to all the members of BEMA who were associated with this, particularly a couple of key members of the building and electrical systems sector within BEMA, who gave us some good advice about electrical connections. And most importantly, members of my flexible energy systems sector, which is basically behind the meter flexibility, and especially the BEMA EV infrastructure group. And I'm glad to say we're joined by uh, two members of that, of that group today. So we're going to hear from them shortly. Um, so big thanks to all, all of those companies who provided advice, who uh, read the document, who uh, provided pictures for the document, and uh, it's, it's been really uh, terrific to work with you on that. So if you'd like to know more about that work of that group, then I'm easily reached, you know how to find me. And um, before we introduce the panelists, I'd like to turn now to Juliet now. So um, before I do, I will just say, there will be some time for some questions. We'll have, we're going to have a panel discussion. There will be hopefully some time for some audience questions. And there is a Q&A box. So please write your questions in there. And between us, Lawrence and I will intercept those questions. We won't have time for them all, but I'll do my best um, to put those questions to the panelists at the end. Um, Juliet. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, apologies, the lighting has seemed to have gone in this room, but I hope everyone can still see me okay. Um, so, yeah, I know that many on the webinar today are members of our coalition, but for those that have not come across the Green Finance Institute before, I'll just provide a brief, a brief background. So, the Green Finance Institute was established in 2019 as a direct policy, as a direct response to a key policy recommendation made by the industry-led Green Finance Task Force to the UK government in March 2018. We sit between the public and the private sector, convening and leading coalitions of global experts that work to identify and unlock barriers to investment towards impactful real economy outcomes which benefit our 
environment, society and business. One of those coalitions is focused on the decarbonisation of road transport and a key priority area of ours is charging infrastructure. As of September, we're 35,000 public charging points in the UK and there's quite a big range of estimates as to how many are going to be required by 2030 but we certainly know that we need an acceleration in the speed of deployment and this will require substantial capital investment which we at the Coalition of Decarbonisation for Transport estimate to be around 20 billion required by 2030. The government's pledged 1.6 billion can therefore only go so far and the majority of the investment will be required to be funded by the private sector. And at the GFI we've been working to create the right environment for that investment to flow at pace and scale whether that's through new financial products, data, or through tools such as the guide that look to build knowledge. And that brings me on to why we collaborated with EMA. Um, so Jeremy's given a really helpful background, um, but just from our perspective, when I joined the Green Finance Institute, I was looking to upskill myself in EV infrastructure and gain a better understanding of the existing business models. Whilst the, there's information out there on this, it was spread across multiple documents or websites and often written by specific parts of the sector, for example, with a narrow focus on one type of charging. And we were also hearing from our charge point operator members who were out looking for finance to scale up that they were being asked common questions about technology and market characteristics by potential investors. And similarly, when we spoke to investors and you know, from my uh, old background, I know that you, know, you have to explain these characteristics of relatively new sectors to investment and committee meetings to be able to get the investment over the line. So we wanted to provide one resource which looked to bridge the knowledge gap faced by stakeholders looking to finance charging infrastructure, ultimately with the aim of unlocking more private capital to accelerate the rollout of the UK's charging network. Our Built Environment Coalition have produced a similar guide for retrofit technologies, which have been well received by the market. And we found Beamer's 2015 guide and thought that this was the closest document to what we had envisioned for explaining the technical side of the infrastructure. So we were therefore delighted to partner with them to update their 2015 guide and supplement their members' technical expertise uh, with the commercial expertise of our coalition members. And just to echo Jeremy's thanks, obviously you know, a great deal of work went into it from Jeremy's members and our members, so thank you very much. Um, I know Jeremy has already spoken about the technical and standards chapters in the guide, and I will just briefly speak to chapter four and five ahead of the panel. So the intention of chapter four was to outline the different locations and types of public and private charge points. The purpose of including this chapter was to help investors understand more about the characteristics of the market segment their potential investment was focused on and to assist potential installers work out the optimum charging solution and business model for their location. I think we can all agree that the needs of drivers cannot be met with just one solution alone and instead a diverse mix of charging solutions is required. The guide won't make decisions for installers, but instead details key questions which should be asked in the development of a project to ensure that the right solution is selected for delivering the use case in question. And then finally, chapter five is intended to support anyone who is looking to finance an EV charging infrastructure project. So here we included examples of important factors which a stakeholder must, con must consider before progressing with a project, as well as questions that a potential financier may ask when evaluating the perceived risk of the project and how reliable the cash flow projections are. Profitable, bus profitable business models for public charging infrastructure without government subsidies do already exist in some locations. You know, we are seeing private investment in the sector um, and this only grows as the sector matures. Recent transactions include uh, InfraCapital's 200 million pound investment into GridServe, uh, Aviva Investors investment of up to 110 million into Connected Curb, um, and Octopus Energy Generations investment of up to 110 million into BEV. 
and you will hear from some um, individuals who are involved in those tra transactions today. So just finally, our coalition is exploring and developing innovative ways to crowd in further private finance to this sector. And this guide you know, intends to bridge the current knowledge gap faced by stakeholders. And that's kind of the first step in the journey for our coalition. So I will just hand back to Jeremy and I hope that you will enjoy the panel. Thanks very much, Juliet. We've got a terrific panel today, really, really excited. So just on a personal note, back in 2017 or 18, when I'd only recently taken over management of the FEMA EV infrastructure group and I was still finding my way um, and still learning a bit more about infrastructure and the challenges associated with that. I was fortunate to be asked to join uh, the Mayor of London's EV Infrastructure Task Force, which was a, a group that was looking at expected levels of road transport electrification by 2025 and um, wanted to look into whether we had uh, the, the right infrastructure plan for that uh, just within London. And uh, leading that work was uh, my good friend Colin Heron from Newcastle University He's very kindly agreed to join us today. So you're first on this panel, Colin. Please tell us a little bit. Um, please introduce yourself, obviously. And could you describe for us what a successful rollout looks like? Thank you, Jeremy. Yes, my name's Colin Heron. I'm a professor at Newcastle University. But prior to joining the university two years ago, for at least the last 10 or 12 years, I've been involved in EV infrastructure, installation, analysis of. What do I look for in the infrastructure? I can put it simply. We need the appropriate infrastructure for the expected number of vehicles and the technology to be deployed at a point in time. Not anything else other than the appropriate infrastructure. What Jeremy's asked me to do is just give a little brief on where I think we are now. And I will, if anybody is mad enough to follow me on LinkedIn, they'll probably recognize some of the things I'm going to say, and it should kick off the, a little bit of the discussion. The standards in the, the document which has been produced is fabulous, and it explains everything that you need to know for the infrastructure. However, about 2010, the government launched what was called the Plugged in Places initiative, which was three regions. My region was one, the Northeast, where we put in infrastructure under the Charger Car brand. It was then extended to more regions in the UK. Perversely, Yorkshire was left out, so we couldn't actually drive across the UK with the technology at the time. Then followed the Go Ultra Low Cities, and until recently, my small team managed the Milton Keynes Go Ultra Low Infrastructure Project, for which we've done a lot of analysis and published some of the results. That was what the public sector was doing. The private sector was mainly led by the Ecotricity Initiative, which was, became known as the Electric Highway, which was to put what was then a mega power charger, the 50 kilowatt DBT charger, across the UK on every motorway location, which we did all the way up the John O'Groats. That was followed by an EU funded rapid charge network, which was very similar. And all we put about 300 rapid chargers in. On all of these initiatives, we actually collected the use data, the utilization data, how people were using them against what their alternatives were at that time, which was street charging, home charging, work charging. So we then went to the next phase. Unfortunately, the next phase did not include any technology forecasting. So I've now been driving an EV for over nine years. And my first one was the 24 kilowatt hour leaf at about 86 miles. And in the Northeast winter, you weren't gonna get 86 miles. We didn't do any supply forecasting. This for me was the major and still is the major block in everything. We assumed a growth pattern would continue based on sales. We then stopped doing behavior studies. We stopped wondering what people were actually going to do with these vehicles who'd never had them before. For some reason also, we did no feedback loops, again, of behaviors. But was anybody actually using this equipment? When were they using it? 
what was the utilization of it? Early on, there was a proposal for a strategic road network put to government, but it was decided not to do it. So we move on to now when we've had the recent strategy paper taking charge. So where do I think we are now? We have a bean counting obsession of which local authority has put the most charges in. It's printed many, many times on LinkedIn and the press. To the best of my knowledge, there is absolutely no proven correlation between charge and numbers in registrations. And how we can compare Westminster with Truro is something that, that defeats me. So just doing bean counting doesn't make sense. The government have announced we need charger numbers from 300,000, but it might be 700,000, but not by type. So what is a charger? It just doesn't stay by type. And all these caveats are in the strategy. We still don't do behavior analysis, and we know for a fact people are changing their habits. People have now got the option of charging at work. And if you can charge at work for less than at home, that's what you will do. The rapid charge hubs are appearing all over the place. Are people preferring a quick charge with the new technology? There's no evidence of geospatial mapping. So where are these vehicles actually living? What type of people are acquiring them? Can we map it on to off-street parking? And some companies have got this information. Technology forecasting is also missing from the strategy. So if we go to 800 volt systems, we'll have the charging time. What impact will that have on charger numbers? Supply forecasting of vehicles is still omitted. And it still is a mystery to some people that you need one battery for one car. In the UK, we have a battery capacity of 50,000 batteries. That's all we have. That's all we've had for 10 years. And for at least another three years, that's all the battery capacity we'll have. Volkswagen are actually sold out till 2023. So the correlation of simply putting more charges in the match supply is failing. Again, we still don't do any behavior studies. Again, we don't have any feedback loops of utilization. And I know one installer told me that one public charger they put in has not been used for 14 months at all. So that is a bit of a controversial view. Um, I'm happy to be challenged on it. But if you read the government strategy, which you've just put out called taking charge, you will find it is caveated all the way through with all the points I've just made. Thank you. So thank you very much, Eeyore. That's a uh, uh, very, very useful challenge. Um, so we've heard a little bit now there about how difficult some of these things are or the challenges of data and so on. Um, I want to move now to our, um, our next panelist who I think we're having some trouble with the video feed. So she's just joining by audio, uh, unfortunately, but Priya Varapan, uh, who's Managing Director of Infra Capital, who have successfully um, made some investments. Um, Priya, well, welcome. Do tell us a bit about yourself and could you where the investor is in all of this and uh, what are the challenges, but perhaps also uh, some of the opportunities. Sure, Jeremy, thank you. Um, and I hope you can um, hear me okay. Apologies for the for the technology issues on the, on the video. Um, yeah, as you said, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm a managing director within Infra Capital. Infra Capital are a, um, a manager of infrastructure funds and we invest in um, sustainable infrastructure assets. Uh, both operational and those that are in development. Um, InfraCapital have six billion under management sterling over four funds. Um, my specific role is to look at the greenfield strategy. So that is investing in companies, platforms or projects where a significant component of the capital that we allocate, it goes towards capital expenditure effectively, um, as opposed to sort of purchasing operating businesses. So these are typically high growth um, platforms or companies um, that are t undertaking a sort of rollout program. And clearly um, electric vehicle charging fits well into that sort of category of investment, given the sort of scale of the challenge ahead of us, as you've alluded to, Colin. 
Um, so uh, as, as a team, we've assessed you know, a numerous um, charging um, opportunities over the course of the last 12 months. And, and actually, um, InfraCapital moved quite early into the space with an investment in um, a company called Recharge, um, who are the leading charge point operator in the Nordics. And that was um, in 2020. So in the UK, we've had um, the benefit of a little bit of knowledge and data coming out of a company that from a country which is arguably a few years ahead in terms of adoption rates and usage of charging infrastructure which has been very helpful when we think about um, how we look at the UK rollout. Um, in August of uh, this year we made an investment into GridServe, um, as Juliet alluded to earlier, and, and picks up the point on sort of the electric highway that Colin was talking about, and are looking to sort of fund the further expansion and growth of that electric highway network. Um, but coming to your question, Jeremy, around um, where are our investors and, and what are the challenges that they face in assessing these opportunities? I mean, I think it's, it's a really interesting question, and probably, um, start by saying that there are a huge range of views and a huge range in the level of maturity of understanding um, which is moving very quickly. Um, I'd say broadly speaking we can categorise um, the investor universe and when I say investor universe I, I mean infrastructure investors as opposed to sort of venture capital or, or private equity um, into, into three broad groups. What, one who are sort of interested watching with caution, um, see there being sort of tailwinds, that's a word you, you hear a lot, but still feel it's too early to make an investment themselves because the rate of adoption of EVs is too uncertain. Um, there are questions around the supply chain and, and sort of more fundamental questions about when this infrastructure is actually going to be needed and you know, sort of remain to be convinced about that piece. Um, and then I think there's a second group who are keen to, to make an investment in the sector, um, have got to the point of really believing in EV adoption, but haven't yet sort of decided what which sort of segment they want to invest in. So is it at home? Is it en route? Is it destination? Is it fast and rapid charging? Is it slow AC long duration charging? And, and are sort of in the process of developing a thesis as to how this segmentation will evolve and I think from our perspective we we understand that there is a place for all of those um, but I you know others are are still sort of pondering that question and I think the third group are those who are actively bidding and investing like ourselves and, and as you alluded to Julia Aviva um, and and others that have um, and ten various other infrastructure funds that have made investments over the course of this year um, there's a lot of activity in the UK and across Europe um, for those who are, you know, willing to invest, I guess, for the long term. So I think you alluded to patient capital when we spoke earlier. I think that that's relevant because you will have to wait some time to see rollout deliver the returns that are going to be um, required by the investor community. So in short, you know, it's a real mix, a, a real evolution of thought going on at the moment I think these processes that you know these um, knowledge base that you're creating is really helpful in, in educating everybody because I think there was a huge there's still a huge education process to go and you know to, to Colin's point about certainty from government and proper analysis and thought through strategy that is also going to be very important in terms of encouraging investor sentiment um, I, I think what, what are we looking for when we look at for, for CPO um, investment to back? I think we're looking for capacity to deliver at scale, um, a, a strong team that is able to demonstrate that they can A, deliver um, profitable sites and, or, and a good customer experience, um, longevity of that investment, so exclusivity over certain um, clients or sites and you know ESG is, is important so sustainable practices in, in procurement um, so those are sort of some key areas that we we look at and assess I'll stop there Jeremy um, don't want to take up too much of your time but hopefully that sort of addresses some of the points you were keen to to hear about no thanks that's that's brilliant Priya and I'm, I'm actually scribbling notes to myself um, on 
what investors are looking for. So that's really useful. I want to come back to these three segments of investors that you mentioned, which I really like. So you have your cautious observers for whom I think both supply chain challenges and projections for demand are scary. And I get mm -hmm. that. And I think as, for, as further to what Colin said earlier, one of the main um, antidotes to that fear is better data, but clearly supply chain challenges. You can have all the data in the world and you're not going to solve those supply chain challenges. So I want to turn to Juliet now, who as well as being a co-author of this guide is also a panelist. So thanks, Juliet. Um, can we take that middle segment that Priya mentioned? So not the cautious observers who are just watching and waiting and not those um, like InfraCapital who are actively bidding and investing. But in the middle, you've got those people who are keen to invest, not sure where to go. Basically, how do we help those who have the capital but aren't investing? Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, as I mentioned up front, there is a big gap in the funding requirements. And I think that second group and maybe hopefully some of the first group at some point will you know, come in to help fill that gap. Um, what I think is quite important at the moment now is, so traditionally, I think local authorities have been um, in charge of rolling out charging infrastructure or, or have done a big part of the rollout to date. And, you know, in the current economic climate, borrowing costs are continuing to rise for them. So, you know, there really does exist a huge opportunity for private capital to be involved in this sector. And what we think is quite key and how to get those groups in is using that limited remaining public capital as a lever to crowd in further private capital. And this can be done by creating de-risking de mechanisms. And an example of one of those de-risking products, which as an organization, GFI always speak to, is the benefits of guarantees, not grants. You know, that there are still areas where there is definitely a role for public capital, and these will be concentrated in areas which are not as commercially viable, but that be at the local authority or the local community see that there is you know, a community need for infrastructure there. But this doesn't need to always be 100% of that project, which I think to date local authorities have done a lot of themselves, you know, especially if there is private sector appetite for a portion of that project. And therefore, using blended finance products uh, and crowding in you know, the private capital that is there and has a bit of appetite, but you know, wasn't quite prepared to do 100% of the project at this point in time, but is almost there. You know, that is a really powerful way of you know, doing more with the limited public capital that's available and ensuring that it's spent in an efficient way that actually generates further capital. And as that, you know, as the funding then continues to decrease further and further, hopefully that portion of private capital can just increase um, to 100%. Uh, also with EV infrastructure, you know, there's a big a big barrier we keep hearing about, which has been alluded to already on this call, is um, utilisation rates, which is why as an organisation we're working to design a product uh, called utilisation linked loans, where um, the idea behind it is that repayments would only commence when charge points are revenue generating or once they achieve um, a pre-agreed base of utilization and then be linked to utilization going forward um, it just looks to reduce the concern that utilization rates would not be realized in the short term and cause debt liabilities to be greater than revenue you know that's just one example of a innovative uh, de-risking financial product that could come to market and help there um, and I just think finally which has definitely been said plenty already but I will just continue to echo it is you know in making data, especially utilization data, more widely available, which can really help with investor concerns that the sector is still perceived as you know, a risky bet. Um, I think those are some key ones. So thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, Juliet. Um, lots I want to say on that, but I'm, I'm going to resist the temptation because of time and so on. George, um, George Donahue, you're the Chief Technical Officer of the CPO. Um, CPOs have a special role to play in this. Um, question for you first is what's a CPO, what do you do, and um, how does this guide help? It, it helps enormously, Jeremy, thank you. So um, I, I'm CTO for Connected Carb, and, and a charge point operator's fundamental role 
uh, is to deploy the charging assets in the right place in coordination with uh, local authorities or other commercial models. Um, and where we fit into that kind of charge point operator model, uh, we specifically feel that 60% of people or drive will not have driveways. Um, or whether you believe that percentage or not, the fundamental issue is the majority of consumers will be living in multi-dwelling environments and will not have access to a home charger. And we are here to address that challenge in terms of providing charging that's safe, reliable, and in those environments. And we fundamentally try and achieve that through local authorities. But that leads to a couple of things that lead into the the, the, the strength of what was within the paper. Is if you're going to chart, if you're going to deploy those kind of assets, and back to some of Juliet's points and Colin's points. You have to have a charger that's got resilience and reliability over the 15-year, 20-year term. There is no good, and various local authorities have had challenges around this, where they've deployed assets that lasted only two or three years. And of course, the challenge with that is you have to start all over again. And that is no good to anybody. It's no good to the citizen, and it's certainly not good to the CPO, unless the CPO has a seller box strategy. And fundamentally, that's what we're not about. We're about propositioning an infrastructure that goes into the ground and can be sustained and endured over that term. And I think that's where we fit really neatly into the, the journey that infrastructure investors are at, because an infrastructure investor fundamentally wants to know, will the asset stay in situ? Will it be able to perform and operate? And will it be able to not be end up being stranded and we can recover the cash flows? And I think that's, a, that's our mental model, is we, we're trying to push that. Uh, into 15 year, 20 year warranties. So I think that's a really important thing as well from our perspective. If I think about the categories that Priya kind of set out, um, most of those that are hanging back still have the, the kind of question mark of if this will happen. Um, and I think the challenge with that is, is people that are looking a little bit too hard at the IRRs and not thinking about actually where it's going to be in 10 years time. And fundamentally our belief is that this is happening, it's a question of when and at what scale. And then to address that scale issue, can you provide enough scalability of sourcing componentry? Can you source enough uh, equipment to make sure it relies over the 15 year term? And then just last little point for me, I guess, in terms of where the guide helps, is it sets out some of the key technology challenges. Um, key things that we need to think really hard about is plug and charge. Or, or what's got the really fascinatingly uh, sexy term of 15118 or ISO 15118. Um, we need to find better names for these things, by the way, just as a commentary. Um, but if we think about plug and charge, plug and charge, and the ability to walk up to a charger, plug into the charger and walk away and not worry about the experience, no need for contactless, no need for RFIDs. That is a key thing that we need to think about longer term as an infrastructure strategy. And therefore, if we start thinking about that now, we then don't have the redundancy issues that if you put contactless devices in all these machines, you're adding cost, and therefore they'll need dilapidated in a couple of years once we've got a digital solution. So the paper sets out these kind of challenges quite well, so that you can start to walk through the waterfall of what are the technologies, what are the mechanics, and what are the criteria for investment. And we were very happy to be involved with it because it should provide a better certainty of not the if, but the when. Thanks, George. I should add that Connected Curve is the one member that the Green Finance Institute and BIMA have in common. So it was, uh, it was great to have you in, involved in that. I don't think we could have scripted that better if we tried. So, uh, Tom, uh, we've just moved on to the technology. You actually provide the technology, which is great. Um, what's your reaction to all this? And um, maybe I can ask you to reflect a little on what we should be doing more to promote the technology, the integration, consumer awareness and the engagement that we need. Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Tom Keller. I'm the uh, head of external affairs for a company called My Energy, we're a UK manufacturer. Um, I think the what, one of the key things to, to start with is actually that uh, a point of reassurance I would make is that the from a technology point of view, we are seeing much more convergence and commonality than we were perhaps sort of five, 10 years ago. So um, whereas you, you used to have to kind of what the technology was and the various compatibility issues, etc., um, of various cables and connector types and inlets and, and plugs and sockets. I think we are in a much better position now than we than we were. Um, we've seen commonality, for example, across the EU and the UK with relation to the to the, to the connectors for 
both AC and DC charging, for example, which, which almost every manufacturer has, um, has kind of uh, aligned themselves with. There are a couple of exceptions, I won't mention who, who are deciding to, to carry on doing it in a slightly different way, but we'll, um, we'll see them no doubt fall into line very soon. Um, I think in terms of the opportunities from, from the technical point of view, um, obviously we, as my energy, we predominantly provide uh, equipment for the, for the home. So we provide home charging points. Uh, and obviously my background includes covering off sort of public charging, particularly DC charging as well. I think the, it's a really exciting time to be investing and looking at investing in this, in this market. Um, we've got obviously certainty of growth. Um, we know the policy is there, the regulatory aspect is there in terms of where the market is headed. Uh, we know there are going to be millions and millions of electric cars uh, in 2030 and beyond. We know they're going to need charging, whether that's at home, at the curbside, um, on forecourts or in hubs, for example. We, we know there are going to be cars and vehicles to charge, uh, and it won't just include cars, of course. Um, I think in terms of what we need to be doing in terms of, uh, when we come to focus on the, um, the, the more technical aspects, it's, it's ensuring that there is awareness of the speed at which the landscape is changing from a policy and regulatory point of view as well. Um, so one of the things, for example, that we don't call out specifically in the report is a, a piece of uh, legislation called the Alternative Fuel Infrastructure Regulations. That there is a great section, if, if for those that haven't seen the report fully yet, and please do, there is a great section about all of the various uh, regulations, electrical regulations and safety regulations that apply to EV charging. Um, but crucially, there is also a roadmap. There is also the timeline, the roadmap looking ahead about what might change. Um, and, and things are constantly being hung on to that roadmap for the next sort of five to 10 years or beyond. So um, if you are looking to invest in this sector, I think it's important to recognise that um, what's true today will probably be changed in 12 months or 24 months. Um, so keeping abreast of what is going on is, is incredibly important. Um, and regulations that apply today will, will no doubt change. Um, and having, you know, having sight of that, but also being confident that the business you're looking at or the investment opportunities you're looking at are taking that into account in their thinking is also critical. So I think we need to pay more attention to the, the changing aspect of the regulatory landscape and policy landscape as well. But I think, as I say, on, on technical point of view, um, it is, a, it is a, a much more convergent market now. Um, there's some exciting opportunities on the, on I'd say, the sort of margins. I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but I mean in terms of things like where we see vehicle to grid technology going, for example, which is called out in the report, um, as George mentions, where we, where we see things like plug and charge going and what applications we might see that in. Um, but also, uh, you know, and going back to Colin's point, um, the behavioural change we're seeing. So the shift, for example, even things like home working, you know, the increase in home working and what impact that's had on, on the use of public charging networks, for example, versus home charging, but also things like the opportunity for integrating with solar. So one of the things that we've seen is actually that the, there's been a growth of people who are suddenly more able to maximise um, their charging from solar energy during the day because their vehicles are no longer parked in an office car park, they're parked, in their, parked outside their house, plugged into you know, one of our charge points with solar panels on the roof, and they're able to charge off sunlight during the day, um, whereas before they were coming home at 6 p.m. and not getting much benefit from the solar. So I think there's, a, there's also those changes to bear in mind as well when it comes to the investment opportunity. It's not, it's not necessarily just in the charging equipment. It's also thinking about the wider ecosystem that wraps around the charging equipment as well. Thank, thanks, Tom. So I want to talk briefly. No, I don't want to talk at all. I want to ask some questions about data. But before I do, um, Tom, you and I have had some conversations about this, and you've mentioned something called the Wimbledon problem or the Wimbledon challenge. I'd like you just briefly to set out what that is, if you know what I'm talking about. No, yeah. if you do, good. Um, and then I think probably a question, probably for Colin and Priya first, but everyone else, feel free to jump in after that. I dream of a world where investors have a forward look, because no doubt the Society for Motor Manufacturers and Traders has has this, or its members have this, no doubt these commercial entities are looking forward and saying, I think I'm going to sell this many hundred or this many thousand electric vehicles in this local authority in the next five years. No doubt individual dealerships or companies generally are monitoring this and working up this data. That would be so valuable for an infrastructure provider or, or installer or investor. So mm. perhaps Tom's told us what the Wimbledon problem is. Then Colin and Priya, would you mind telling us what other forms of data you think we lack and maybe how much better the world would be if we had them? And then after that, we might talk about some of the supply chain fears. So Tom, Wimbledon. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there's a uh, there's a couple things in that. So, two two points I'd make. One, and this is around data, is is be careful what data sources you use. One of the most common data sources out there that is constantly cited is is where vehicles are essentially registered. So, where where is a vehicle being registered? And that often happens during the pre delivery inspection or the pre PDI process for a vehicle, um, which is typically in a huge um, kind of uh, industrial area where thousands and thousands or hundreds of thousands of vehicles are PDI'd and therefore registered uh, every year. And you get these weird pockets where like Peterborough is at the top of every list of EV, of EV adoption in the UK. I can assure you that Peterborough is not the EV adoption capital of the UK, um, but there are some PDI centres in the vicinity of Peterborough that, that skew that data. So be careful what data you're looking at when it comes to figuring out where the electric vehicles are, as Colin said earlier. The Wimbledon problem is around, again, looking at where um, maybe vehicle license, ve vehicles are, are licensed or um, vehicle owning households that say they have an EV. Um, there is a, I was struck by a certain street in Wimbledon with very, very expensive detached houses with probably 10 or 12 car driveways um, that had lots of on street charge points, not George's charge points, I should hasten to add, but lots of on street charge points dotted down them. Um, now, my question I've never ever seen them being used, ever, any of them. And my question is who is using them? Because none of the households need to use them because they all have masses of on street parking and probably access to, to plenty of power. So, um, it's about knowing where the actual demand will be for utilisation, as, as has been mentioned earlier. Um, and very, very briefly, I would say on, on the local authority point in terms of adoption rates, um, it's important to drag in lots of data points into this discussion. Um, one one organisation I would certainly point to, and I hope this is OK to do so, is a company called Field Dynamics, who have excellent uh, research in this space. Uh, and I think they need to be listened to in this area very closely. Um, but there's also a, there's also some assumptions I think might be made that are not necessarily correct around things like socio-economic or demographic data when it comes to EV adoption. Um, ZapMap is not the gospel when it comes to EVs. Um, they're a great business. I have huge respect for ZapMap, but their, their user base might be slightly a non-representative of the wider market. But, but nevertheless, they have a very wide um, user base, a very a very large user base, and therefore their survey data is is to be to be listened to. Um, and they actually showed some interesting um, figures on both the age and income brackets for EV, adopt, the EV drivers. And it's the EV drivers are probably a bit older than you think they are, or there's pro certainly a high proportion in older age brackets, and they're certainly not necessarily as wealthy as you might think EV drivers are. So if you look at kind of the 100k plus income bracket, there's there's quite a lot of drivers in there, but it's it actually it's, it's it's lowering a lot of lower income drivers are adopting them because they see the savings opportunity from an electric vehicle, for example. So we're not talking about people in fuel poverty here. We're talking about those on slightly lower incomes than you might expect. So challenge assumptions, make sure you get good data, is what I'd say. OK, what data? What's on uh, your Christmas card? What's on your Christmas uh, list of data? I think, I think my, Christmas, my Christmas list of data is <laughs> infrastructure is power based and time based, right? So if we were to put a 100 kilowatt charger on a street and everybody turned up at one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, but one car each one, that would be no problem. So one charger would do 24 vehicles. If they all turn up at one o'clock at the same time, that's a problem. So we've been monitoring when people are using street chargers, rapid chargers, etc. Because the power demand is based upon when people plug in. And also, as one of my little slide shows, if in a day everybody who uses a charger uses the, the Renault Zoe I've got, you'll deliver certain power over a certain time. If everybody turns up in a Porsche Taycan, it's a completely different profile. So not only do we need to know who and what, you know, people's behavior, we need to know what vehicles are going to be predominant going forward. And on the data, just to show something which is which is missed, a good friend of mine who runs a taxi company in the Northeast gave four of, well, a group of PhD students, five million bits of journey data, right? Because this taxi company does over 100,000 a week. And the question was, what happens to a taxi company if they all go EV? And it was amazing to try and do geospatial mapping of where all these taxis go using current technology, future technology, et cetera. Then we said, but there's not one taxi company in Newcastle. There's lots of taxi companies. Then you multiply that across the country and nobody's asked this question. 
Has anybody wow. actually done geospatial mapping of every taxi company, which is an integrated part of our taxis, of our transport system? So there's lots of data out there. We don't even know what these taxi drivers will do. Will they fill up at home? Will they fill up at high power chargers? Will they survive? So what we need to be doing is, move, it, at the moment, everything is grant based. So councils install based on the grant rules. Everybody knows that. So they put them as many as possible, as easy as possible. There are some, I know, and there's, there's a guy called Ryan up at East Lothian really looks at what he's doing. And as some local authorities do, but by and large, they've got 12 months to put it in. It goes where it's used, but then it's not measured. So I want utilization data and I want geospatial data. Okay, so George, I'm gonna bring you in in a moment, but first, Priya, what data do you want? What's on your, what's um, on your I'd like a perfect forecast, please, <laughs> of, <laughs> of the industry. Um, look, I mean, what 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 are the questions we're trying to answer? So, what what is my market size, right? Um, how how many charges should I install at each site? Where are these sites going to be best located? How much will those charges be used? How much power will the charges dispense when they are used? Um, and so you, you sort of create all these questions and, and, and then out pops, I guess, your forecast for your um, revenue and, and EBITDA, et cetera. Um, so what, what data would be helpful in establishing that is obviously around, you know, to George's point about, okay, 65% of people won't be able to charge at home, arguably. I mean, how solid is that number? It's a very important number. It, it, it sort of drives a huge amount of, of thinking around the public charging market. Um, how do people behave? Sort of how long do they stay when they go shopping? Do, are they actually going to charge their car when they rock up at the garden center opportunistically or are they not? Um, and cars, you know, what power are they going to absorb um, over time? What's being developed in the pipeline for actual, uh, you know, taking of charge? Because, you know, we, we've obviously invested in the on route sector and, and one of the big challenges there is, range and as range increases what does that do to usage so you know, all these data points are hugely important and the more we can tell from what we've currently got in the ground which isn't very much but the more we can extract that the the better the forecasting is going to be i think and, and the more robust and in terms of unlocking investment as we talked about before the more robust we can be about some of these forecasts the easier it will be George, you're going to say something long here. So, Colin, do you just want to give us just, just a very we'll quick thing on data? You know, when we the the, the figure sixty five percent of people, etc. Yeah. Where I live, a hundred percent of people can charge on their drive. So we quote a national figure. It's nonsense. You cannot compare yeah. rural Northumberland with Hillingdon, right? That's why geospatial. We keep getting broad figures. Mm. In in George's defence, I think his sixty percent is something he puts on a poster, and I think he does a lot of geospatial. My, my, so my a lot point of people is, do this; they just quote yeah. this these glob figures for the UK, and they're a nonsense. Go but on, I think the CPOs themselves. Sorry, sorry, Jeremy. But the, I think the, I think the CPOs themselves, as George will probably attest to, do a lot of work in the geospatial sense of, of actually looking at individual regions and talking I, about I, you know I, income, etc. What, what, can I jump in at that point if that's all right? Yeah, tell, tell us about your maps, George. Come on. So um, I, I don't ever want to dismiss anything at a ton. I, I wouldn't say it's nonsense, but I understand the point. Headline numbers don't help, Colin, which is I think exactly. what you're trying to say. But yeah. the point of data I would offer up, if you look at the smart meter rollout, 30% of homes were very easy to gain access to to enable the rollout because they had driveways. And once you got past that number, it got really hard because they were in multi-dwelling units, they were in multi-variable communal environments. So evidence-based mindset is that had a big challenge in its numbers once it got past the easy stuff. And it got harder once you got past the harder stuff because it was it was communal environments. And that's the same challenge on EV charging. Whether we believe the percentage, the challenge will remain the same. Large majorities of our population who need access to cheaper, sustainable transport will need a charger on the street so that they don't have a driveway. And, and we want to try and achieve that. And it's, there's three things where we talk about the negatives a lot. So let's talk about the positives. There are huge amounts of positives going on. 
One, um, we have AI tools where we take 60 bits of ingestment data, to your point, Colin, where we can see where the lamp posts are, where the bus stops are, where the driveways are, where the human beings are, what's the uptake, how do you disaggregate the, the EV uptake, how, where do you see the EVs going? And we offer that to local authorities as a trust tool to understand where to put the chargers so we don't end up with the scenario that Tom talked about, where you end up with chargers in affluent environments and it's not really serving the right needs. So we provide those tools to local authorities so that we can understand that better. And we're also in active conversations with Bayes and others about how we could make that more of an industry approach. So we'd love to be helpful in that role, not just the CPO self-serve, but see if we can do other things for other people. Um, we've done Agile Streets projects, which is a project where you can get overnight charging on the street at the same price you get on the driveway, and that's going to make a big difference. And we've also done variable things around what we call a sure charge, where, back to Colin's point, what does the data tell you about the driver, the statistics, the, the type of charge periods? And so the end of that comment really is, from an infrastructure investment point of view and what the paper's trying to address, there is huge amounts of great activity going on now where you can start to reach into those data sets. And I would suggest, back to Priya's point, less about forecasts and more about confidence of approach. Are the mechanics correct to give you certainty that the assets will end up in the right places to provide those returns? I think the forecasts will be forever moving. Um, and I think we need an approach that works for all combination of the CPOs and what works for investors. And I'll leave my comments there. Um, that's an excellent summary. We have a few more minutes. I don't think I've seen any questions in the chat. So um, that's good. That gives me, I think, just time to do a little round, Robin, and give you maybe 45 to 60 seconds each. And I've just got one final thing to say at the end. Um, Tom, any final comments? For, I'm going to go in reverse order. Uh, Tom, any final comments from, from you on, on, on anything we've talked about? Um, I would say make sure that you're looking at the right data. Um, there's a lot of it. Um, and if you're not familiar with the industry, you might be looking at the wrong stuff. Right. Um, George, what's your, um, you're feeling good about this industry, I think. You, you have a, like a, a relatively confident forward look, am I right? What more can we be doing to, uh, to not just give investors confidence, but may, maybe to give users confidence who don't have a driveway? I think the key thing is education, and this is what this paper does. So we need to provide rich education to people to get past mythologies, to get past concerns, to see the risks as not risks, but opportunities. So I think that you know, there's lots of stuff, but really we need to get on top of a bit more education across our country, across our communities, and across our business environments so that we actually have a good understanding of what this market looks like. Okay, thanks. And Julia, I'm gonna give this to you last to, to sum up. So Priya, any final comments uh, from you on the challenges and opportunities? Um, yeah, just very briefly, I think the opportunity is huge. There's going to be, there's going to be a lot more of it to come. Um, so this education piece is, is critical, really, to make sure we do unlock that capital efficiently. We don't want to be funding this infrastructure in an inefficient way, um, but because it, it's so important um, for, the, for our decarbonisation programme and, and, and priority. Collins, your 60-second ele elevator pitch to Ozev. Stop bean counting and use some data and science to work out what the national strategy is. Well, we only got to the first floor then. You've got till the seventh if you want to. Uh... No, no, that's fine. That's good. <laughs> Julia. That's it. That's it. Um, uh, Julia. Uh, no, sorry. Um, I think, you know, I, I won't say whatever I agree, completely agree with what everyone else said and maybe just to add into it um, on the finance side I really think that we we need to start getting in that patient capital that lower cost of you know that has lower cost capital and more long-term horizons and I think a big way to do that obviously as we've already spoken about data super key and I just think we need to keep working in a collaborative approach. Um, you know, as George alluded to, CPOs working with local authorities, local authorities sharing that local knowledge they have on behavior in their area, the data piece, obviously, 
um, you know, the, the 2030 ban is closer than we think and decisions need to be made now to ensure that sufficient infrastructure is installed for when that comes. Um, and I think that is probably all I have time for. But thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. So uh, three very quick things from me. The first one is some of you will note that one, one of the things about this guide, and it's almost a sacking offence for Vima that I, I produced a guide that hardly mentions safety at all. So clearly, Beamer, we are very, very focused and very conscious of electrical safety. And what I can say is that in the first quarter of next year, we are planning to publish an update, a sort of a white paper or an annex, if you like, to this guide that looks in more detail at the electrical connections. So we'll be looking at transformers. We'll give a bit more information about transformers, about the other elements of the network infrastructure, wiring, circuitry and so on. We touch on it in this guide, but we don't go into the level of detail that we could in the space available. So there'll be an annex for that. And further to that, I would just like to say um, smart grids, incredibly important. And the level of potential and opportunity, not just for, well, obviously ISO 15118 is, is right there. So vehicle to everything is going to be an incredibly important part of what makes this transition to road electrification possible. Um, and my final point, really, I just want to pick up on the word that Juliet used, which was a collaborative approach. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to, um, to co-write this guide with the Green Finance Institute. Um, it's been a, a really terrific process, and I'd like to thank Juliet and Lauren Hammer, who couldn't be here today, but uh, she, was, uh, so she and Juliet were leading the project for GFI. And uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed that. I commend the guide to you. Um, please wrap it up, send it to your family and friends for Christmas. Please keep it by the bed, whatever you need to do. Uh, keep it in your favorites and uh, give it to your clients, give it to your customers, um, maybe give it to the people you're trying to sell to, whoever. But I, I hope you find it useful and I hope that this continues to grow this important infrastructure development. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks to our crack panel. Amazing. We could talk for another hour and maybe we should schedule something uh, to do a few more of these. But um, that's all from me. I commend the guide. You can get it on the Green Finance Institute website and the Beamer website. And um, yeah, look forward to hearing your feedback.